Welcome to Talking Beat, the podcast for the Portland Police Bureau. We're focusing on thoughtful conversations that we hope will inform and provide you with a small glimpse of work performed by Portland police officers, as well as issues affecting public safety in our city. Here's what's on today's show. The analysis of the shootings does show that a 25% increase from this time this year compared to um, this time last year. But our GVRT members have made some uh, significant arrests over the last couple of days and have recovered several firearms. So what I'm hoping is that those arrests will have an impact um, and we'll see a decline in the number of shootings. Um, On this episode of The Talking Beat, Lieutenant Tina Jones interviews Director Bob Kazi from the Portland Bureau of Emergency Communications, Fire Marshal A.J. Jackson from Portland Fire and Rescue, and has a conversation with Chief Jamie Resch. Good afternoon, Director Kazi. Thanks for coming down today. We really appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Good afternoon. Can you start um, just with a brief overview about yourself and what the Bureau of Emergency Communications is and does so that we have that framing going forward? Yeah, um, thank you for the introduction. I'm Bob Causey, Director of uh, the Portland Bureau of Emergency Communications, uh, which is the 911 and Dispatch Center for not only Portland, but all of Multnomah County. Um, my background is in uh, 911 dispatch since 1995, uh, way back in the day, and I served as director for Clackamas County uh, for 12 and a half years, and uh, then have been here with the city of Portland for the past two years. So how has COVID-19 impacted operations at your shop? Yeah, so um, in a 911 center, obviously, we don't have the luxury of being able to um, uh, to vacate our premises. Um, our backup center happens to be uh, much smaller than our existing center. So what do you do with a pandemic and keeping your employees safe? Um, our call volume has decreased uh, pretty substantially um, during this event, uh, thankfully, and uh, that has certainly helped. Um, but we've also increased the number of, of questions that we ask on every call for service. Uh, for example, on a, uh, a typical police-related event, we wouldn't normally ask medical questions, but now we are asking about recent travel or uh, if anyone has been experiencing COVID-19-related symptoms. Uh, so we're incorporating that into our daily uh, activities. So... Can I go back a little bit? Can you describe what it looks like in your center or for people who may not be familiar? Because it's kind of behind the scenes. Yeah, we are behind the scenes. And um, in uh, most 911 centers, you'll have uh, consoles or positions where uh, call takers work and they answer 911. Uh, we happen to answer 911 at uh, our bureau, but we also answer non-emergency lines. Uh, and, and it happens to be the same people who are answering 911 as answer those non-emergency lines. Um, there's always a priority for 911, and those um, go into the queue first. Uh, but those same individuals are fielding a ton of different questions and requests that are both emergent and non-emergent. Um, from that point, there's a section or a couple sections within the operations floor. One is for police dispatch and one is for fire dispatch. So when the call taker processes a call, uh, they enter that into the computer system and uh, the dispatcher then, if it's a police call, that police dispatcher will send out the appropriate units. On a fire or medical call, the fire dispatcher sends out the appropriate units. So I've been there myself in the past uh, for a sit-along, and it's fascinating to me the amount of process or information that your team processes mm -hmm. in a very short amount of time. Um, and they do it for police and fire um, and emergency medical services, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal for the whole county yeah. as well. So given all that, what changes has have been implemented in the past couple of weeks to keep BOIC members safe? Yeah, that's a, a good question. We have... Um, uh, relatively small operations floor, 
um, because we have so many employees working in there, it tends to get a little bit crowded. So we were concerned uh, early on, it's probably been about uh, five or six weeks now, that we began social distancing uh, or physical distancing at the uh, positions. So what that means is rather than uh, call takers working side by side, we're having them um, not utilize a position in between. Uh, call takers. Same thing with dispatch. So now we have them um, distanced out from each other, but we're overcrowded already. So what do you do with these other people? Well, one thing that we have done is opened up our simulation training room, uh, which normally is only used for training. Uh, we've assigned, there's eight positions in there, and we've assigned um, call takers for overflow if it's appropriate. We also have training teams that are working in there answering live 911 calls as opposed to just simulated training. Um, and that has certainly helped. We also, if um, circumstances warrant, uh, one of the call takers would uh, work within the supervisor pod um, amongst the supervisors because that's a little bit more spaced out. We just want to make sure that there's at least six feet of distance between our employees while they're working. Uh, we've also um, implemented rigorous cleaning um, standards. Um, our dispatchers used to rotate uh, about every two hours to a different position to help uh, reduce their uh, their burnout, uh, quite frankly. And uh, now we're uh, we've shifted that so that they only um, switch around to different positions, usually one time within their shift. Um, so that prevents us from having to um, that kind of that cross contamination with with uh, positions. Um, they're cleaning the positions very frequently. Of course, um, one thing that we've had to do recently is implement a requirement for them to wear face coverings. And um, while it's uncomfortable and it's difficult uh, and quite challenging for some of our folks, um, it is necessary because our goal is to keep everybody safe. Yeah, we're all adapting and just getting used to these kind of new norms. Yeah. So can you give us an overview of how many calls are answered at BOIC on the 911 and non-emergency numbers? Yeah. Um, you know, our general planning rule of thumb is about a million calls per year across the board, about 500,000 911 calls, and about the same uh, for the non-emergency administrative lines. Um, what's interesting is this past... Um, months, the um, uh, due to COVID and because of the uh, the quarantine orders, um, our call volume has decreased. Um, last month decreased by about, um, and I'm talking last month meaning April, uh, decreased by about 17 percent, which is substantial, and that has has certainly helped. Uh, we've also been uh, been looking at some of our trends, our overall calls for service. Um, have decreased the dispatch workload um, by about 8% or so. So in general, um, it's, uh, it feels more like a, a winter day for our dispatchers rather than a busy summer day. Um, although uh, we have noticed on the nicer days uh, here in the Portland area, um, when it's sunny outside, the calls for service tend to creep up. And again, just a reminder, that's for all calls um, that you guys triage for police, fire, and medical. That is correct, so, yes. And the, the chief will get into a little bit more about our calls for service when, in her update. Um, so how has COVID affected 911 and non-emergency calls? Well, um, I think primarily uh, we, are, we are receiving a fewer 911 calls, like I had mentioned earlier. Um, but all of our calls now are requiring um, the questioning um, that I had, had mentioned earlier. And those questions that we ask on every call are, um, are you or anyone there experiencing a fever, cough, or shortness of breath? Um, has there been any out-of-state travel in the past 30 days? And has there been any known exposure to COVID-19? That is one of the biggest shifts in our uh, normal day-to-day -day protocol. So it's added some additional questions. It has. And, and what are the dispatchers or call takers doing with that information? Why is that important? The, yeah, they're annotating that in the call so that uh, the first responders, police, fire, or medical, whoever's responding, can have a clearer picture of some of the risks that might be involved at that residence or business. And about how long have those questions been 
implemented? Uh, it's, several weeks? Yeah, it's been several weeks. Great. Now, is the dispatch center receiving an increase in calls related to the governor's order? Yeah, it, it's not substantial. Uh, we have received some. Um, we, uh, When we receive a complaint that a business is open that maybe shouldn't be, for example, we'll enter that call for service, and that is reviewed by um, the appropriate police agency to make a determination on uh, what action needs to be taken. So you're currently wearing a couple of hats. I know this week you've been serving as uh, Portland's incident commander at the um, Emergency Coordination Center. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and any thoughts you have overall about Portland's response to COVID-19? Yeah. Um, in working in public safety, I'm familiar with uh, how the Emergency Coordination Center works. Um, but having a director, uh, we rotate in for a week at a time, and having a director's perspective in there, I think serves two purposes. First, it um, helps the director of what, whatever bureau is serving have a clear understanding of what is happening behind the scenes in terms of this type of response. And it also allows the director perspective in those activities uh, so that when decisions are made that um, a, a bureau director can be able to offer insight that might have a, a positive or negative impact on, uh, on that particular bureau. So again, that's kind of behind the scenes work. Can you describe what it what is happening on a daily basis or weekly basis? Yeah, the there are a lot of meetings. Uh, <laughs> honestly, a ton of meetings, uh, starting with a seven thirty briefing with the leadership team, and getting up to speed on what needs to be addressed for that particular day. And then uh, going into um, an all group meeting right in the. Um, right on the floor uh, with everyone present uh, with reports from the different section chiefs on specific projects that they're going to be working on, what their focus is for that day. And then um, a lot of other sub-meetings in, in the conference room, and we all um, are wearing masks in there, our face coverings, uh, to make sure that, uh, that we're careful not to spread a virus, if there is one, uh, in the Emergency Coordination Center. Um, all of those meetings sum up into a direction that uh, the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management needs to take. One of the, um, I guess, the biggest aha moments for me was just how much coordination there is uh, between not only the city of Portland, but also Multnomah County, the state, metro, um, and, and even looking at uh, coordination with other states and uh, watching how, uh, you know, a reopening framework, for example, um, for the state of Oregon, how that might impact expected illnesses down the road and watching other states and other countries um, begin to reopen uh, has a direct impact on us. So we're monitoring all that activity, looking yes. more broadly, but also trying to figure out how any of those ideas can be implemented in Portland and Multnomah County? Yeah, not, and not just the ideas, implementing the ideas, but recognizing where the pitfalls might be so that we don't make uh, the same mistake someone else has, perhaps. Yeah, that's important. Well, is there anything that I forgot to ask that you would like to add? You know, um, it's a pleasure being here. I thank you for the opportunity, and uh, it's been a great experience working in the Emergency Co Coordination Center. Does anybody on the line have any questions for Director Kazi? Brenna Kelly with KPTV, and my question for Director Causey is, you mentioned you used to rotate every two hours between positions to help reduce burnout. Um, now you've shifted that. How do you prevent burnout now since you're switching people less and prevent, you know, the, the anxieties I'm sure this must take and tools this must take on dispatchers? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, imagine, um, put yourself in the position of being a call taker, for example. You're talking to people on the worst day of their lives. And um, that's a lot of responsibility for a call taker, and it's a lot of uh, pressure. Um, it, it, it's a balance because uh, the ideal, at least in uh, my perspective, is allowing the call taker to rotate out of that position into maybe a dispatch position at police for a while and then come back to call taking. Um, this was uh, done in order to prevent uh, spreading COVID-19 on the ops floor, of course, 
But we got input from our staff, and many of them were concerned and even uh, volunteered uh, to uh, saying that they would be willing to work call taking their entire shift if it meant reducing the spread. Understanding that this is not a permanent measure, that our goal is to get back to that normal two-hour rotation um, as soon as we can. But we are waiting and, and trying to watch, just like I mentioned earlier with the Emergency Coordination Center, we're watching for that guidance to determine when we can kind of step back. Um, that also includes um, wearing face coverings for our dispatchers. Um, all of that has an impact on them psychologically and emotionally, um, dealing with people on their worst days. Now, um, uh, something that we do have in place, uh, of course, is an EAP program, but we also have a, a fantastic peer team that uh, helps provide resources and just a listening ear sometimes. Uh, and those are peers within the 911 center that are available to help talk us through, um, you, you know, different emotions and feelings. Uh, and that's something we've had in place for, for years. Thank you. And just a follow up, are there opportunities for them to switch out if they need to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do try to balance this uh, so that they aren't uh, burning out at one position or another. And on that, so when you're talking about them switching out, you mentioned the call taking, would they go from call taker to maybe dispatching or what different? Yeah, um, I think in a, in a, a perfect world, uh, many of our, of our employees would prefer to stay at a dispatch position. Uh, it's a lot more dynamic, uh, but uh, in all reality, we have 911 calls coming in. Uh, so the call takers, um, and, and we have more call taker positions than we have dispatch positions. So in a, a given day, a call taker might work six hours um, cut into two-hour blocks in call taking. Um, and in between those blocks, maybe they'll work two hours in police dispatch and then two hours in fire dispatch. Um, that would be kind of the ideal um, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it's a you know eight hours in call taking uh, with only two hours at one dispatch discipline or the other. And again, you guys work twenty four seven. So yes. um, how what kind of shifts do you have? Oh, there's uh, shifts that start basically every two hours around okay. the clock, so and around it, the clock. Uh, it ramps up so that we have uh, the lion's share of our employees during our busiest call volume. Uh, yesterday, I just looked at the stats, and our busiest hour was 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I think we answered 180-some 911 calls just in that one hour from wow. 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Um, so we try to um, beef up our staffing so that during the busy call volumes, we have more people on duty. Okay. Again, Director Kazi, really want to extend our gratitude for you coming down today and to your staff. Um, your support of what we do is just phenomenal. Um, we couldn't do what we do without you and your team. So right. Thank thanks you. for being here. So our next guest today, uh, I'm pleased to say, is Fire Marshal A.J. Jackson. Thanks for coming. Hi. Thank you. So um, first, can you just share a little bit about yourself and what your role is with the Fire Bureau? Um, so my name is AJ Jackson. Um, I've been with Portland Fire for about 21 years now, and my current assignment is the Fire Marshal uh, for Portland Fire and Rescue. So I uh, lead the Prevention Division, so I oversee several different components, but um, our mission is to prevent the emergency on the front side before the fire or whatever it is could happen. So we're working on the front side of emergencies. Awesome. So as the fire marshal of the prevention division, then, what are your unit's normal responsibilities and how has that changed during COVID-19? So as the, you know, our name implies, everything is about the prevent, the prevention uh, component. And so we do that through a multiple pronged approach. So the first thing that you can think of when a building is built, we do the plan review. So whether it's a school, a restaurant, uh, takeout, a high rise, we're going to review those plans to ensure compliance with the fire code. So we're looking at our fire department access. Uh, do we have water supply? Is it adequate? Hydrant spacing? Um, things of that nature um, that we'll try to ensure is safe on the front side. Then once that building is built, uh, it's our job to maintain it. So we do code enforcement inspections. So. Um, we're doing inspections of all commercial occupancies and all residential units that have three units or more. 
So we're going to go in and do those inspections, ensure that the fire and life safety component, so that's your sprinkler systems, your alarms, uh, is your address visible? Are your evacuation routes and egress lit, open, accessible? So we'll continue to do those code enforcement inspections. And then if for some reason, and unfortunately a fire does occur, the fire investigations unit will come in and try to determine what that cause was. So it's really important for us if we know how a fire started, some of that helps shape our outreach campaigns. So maybe, for example, we're seeing an increase in home cooking fires or maybe unattend, uh, unattended candles or maybe it's intentionally set and there's an arsonist and this group will try to identify that person and build the legal case in order to prosecute. And then finally, and maybe most importantly, we educate the public. We try to reach out, you know, share our safety messaging to try to avoid those emergencies. So that can be the importance of having working smoke alarms, having a home escape plan uh, that your family members or roommates are aware of. It might be um, having your 72-hour emergency preparedness kit at home. So we try to do that outreach with the public with the mind of trying to prevent those emergencies. I just want to stop and kind of dig into that a little bit. I feel like people, you know, a lot of people right now um, might have a little extra time at home. And especially during a pandemic, we start to recognize that sometimes the bad thing could happen. So I feel like there's an opportunity for individuals or families maybe to get a little better prepared. Do you have any tips about what they could be considering to be better prepared? Yeah. To prevent um, some of these catastrophes. Yeah, I think about, you know, whether it's your home or your apartment or you rent a room, like one of the most important uh, safety tools that you have is your smoke alarm. And how many people put it off, put it off, like, oh, I'm sure it works. I'm not going to test it. But the importance of, do I have them? Are they working and are they in the right location? So now it gives you a perfect time to kind of do a walkthrough of your home. Do I have those? If you have small children or maybe you have multi-generational family members. So um, do they know what to do? Do they know their evacuation routes? So, for example, if you have young children at home, maybe this is a good exercise to take up some time. Create a map of each floor of your home or your apartment, you know, if it's an apartment unit, and try to identify your two ways out of every room. Talk about in the emergency, what are you going to do? Maybe get a smoke alarm, make it sound so children understand what does this sound like? And when this sounds, what am I going to do? You know, I'm going to get out, I'm going to stay out, and I'm going to go to my family's meeting place, wherever that is. Um, I think about today being May 1st. It's um, also Fire Prevention Awareness Month. So what we know is they're expecting uh, greater temperatures, drier. You know, we're about a month ahead of schedule. So maybe now's the time to get out, maybe prune back some trees, right? What combustibles you have around your home, reduce that risk. Think about if I'm going to have a recreational fire, think about some of the consequences of that ember and the wind and it takes off somewhere and lands and that causes a fire. You know, resources across the city and state are being impacted by COVID-19. So do your part to try to make your family as secure um, and as safe as possible. So um, that, that was that would be one of a couple of my recommendations. Awesome. And I assume you have some of these tips probably on your website. Yes, so hopefully absolutely. So they are on our website. Uh, we have a tab like uh, for your safety. And so there's information on uh, child safety seats, uh, window safety, your emergency preparedness kit, what to try to maybe start gathering right now. You may not want to go out and hit the stores up trying to get this complete list, but you can start to assemble some of those items that would be really beneficial in a you know, emergency type situation. And window safety, I know that that's really important. I know we've been on tragic calls mm -hmm. when the weather warms up, and so that's something good to be thinking about now um, to make sure that windows, especially if they're multi-story buildings, are safe for children. Absolutely. Uh, and the Stop at 4 campaign uh, and some of the devices that can be used, that still renders the window operational if it was an emergency, but it keeps our small children safe from falling over, from pushing that screen out. And, you know, it's really tragic when something like that occurs and you know it can be prevented. Absolutely. 
So let's pivot a little bit and talk about some of the awesome programs that Portland Fire and Rescue has been um, involved with during the COVID-19 mm-hmm. crisis. Um, what programs has your team been involved with and, and how do they work? Um, well, thank you. Uh, yes, I'd like to highlight uh, two specific programs. Um, one is the C19Oregon.com. So that's the C, the numeral one, the numeral nine, Oregon.com, which is a free online tool that is um, kind of a health assessment um, program out there that you can use to kind of symptom check yourself. So uh, if you go to that website, it's really easy, user-friendly to kind of navigate, and it's going to ask some very simple questions like your age, your zip code, what symptoms you might be experiencing, and if you have any pre-existing medical conditions. And so once those inputs are in, it's going to give you an assessment, either a green, a yellow, or a red. So green would be the lowest risk, you know, The recommendation is to stay home, continue to monitor yourself, perhaps do your temperature check. Uh, Yellow is moderate health risk, so stay at home, but contact your primary care physician by phone. This isn't, you know, run to the ER, it's stay put, but contact your doctor and talk through what you're experiencing. And finally, the red. So if you come out as a red assessment, it's going to urge you to seek medical attention, but it's also going to allow the hospitals, uh, like the incoming hospital, like, hey, you're coming. Uh, so it's a heads up to them, like, hey, we have a patient that could be COVID-19 positive. Uh, the one uh, aspect of this tool I really like is it can redirect someone to another hospital. So if their local hospital is experiencing a surge in numbers, it can reroute them to another hospital. So it's a win-win. They get the treatment they need as quickly as possible, and we help limit um, the hospitals getting overrun with patients. So um, that's really smart. Yeah, I think in the big picture, uh, the C19 Oregon uh, tool gets the right resources to the right place at the right time uh, for those that have the greatest need. Yeah, and like you said, it helps people to get quicker treatment, which is really important, especially if they're experiencing those really um, problematic symptoms that could be life-threatening. You know, there's that anxiety. You're at home and you're trying to monitor, and people have that fear of the exposure to the virus. So should I be trying to seek out medical care in person, or can I maybe do this by phone, a virtual doctor's appointment? So I think it's, it gives them a tool, right? They're, they're just not home, isolated by themselves, trying to figure out in their own mind, am I bad? Should I go in? Should I stay at home? So it just helps walk them through some of those steps. That's great. And then there's another project that you guys have had um, involving pharmaceuticals. Yeah, right. so... Um, We have our Portland Fire and Rescue Meds on Wheels, which was a program that was initiated by Chief uh, Sarah Boone. And so it is primarily a prescription pickup and delivery service. And so um, it's uh, coordinated through our uh, community health assessment teams. And so this is a program that's targeting the 65 years and older population or those with disabilities or chronic health concerns. And it's available to anybody that uh, is living in the city of Portland. So what we do is we deploy those teams and uh, pick up those medications and deliver them. But we're trying to make sure we do that in a safe way. So we limit our risk and we limit their risk. So we're following PPE guidelines, wearing masks, gloves, making sure that exchange of medication at the door is done safely. Um, The feedback that we've gotten from the members that we have delivered these medications to is amazing. I think um, in this time when it's so challenging and so many people are feeling afraid and isolated, to have someone come up and be willing to engage with you and provide you a resource flyer. So it has a loneliness hotline, you know, um, recommendations if you're having food shortages and you need food, uh, where you can go for some of that. But it's that human connection. You know, and um, one of the teams returned and they had delivered some medications. And this was the first conversation this person had had in eight weeks. Oh, my. And so they see the uniform, they trust us, and they look forward to us. And we're providing the medications that they need so desperately without putting them at risk for having to go out in the public and get them themselves. Yeah, that's just got to be so meaningful for them. So Mm -hmm. that's a tremendous effort. I know, you know, all of these things are on top of the daily work, but I think that your team has been demonstrating a lot of leadership 
in the region on these programs. So it's very much appreciated. Is there anything else that you want to add um, that I forgot to ask? No, I, I think we just recognize, our Bureau recognizes that we have to stop and pause and look at the services we provide and under the circumstances we're in now, how can we do them differently and still achieve our mission? And we recognize uh, from a state and county and city level that the demands are there. And so we see the need and the importance of sharing those resources to get the overall mission accomplished. You know, we are in this together. And um, we see the importance of trying to help our community through this crisis. And that might mean that we look and do our jobs a little bit differently. Yeah, we adapt. That's mm -hmm. what we've been doing. So awesome. We really appreciate you coming today and sharing some information. I know there's a lot more on your website. Uh, you guys also put out some really great stuff on social media. And um, we very much appreciate your partnership and the work that your team is doing to keep everyone safe. Well, thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk with your listeners. Absolutely. Have a good day. Thank you. Next, we will have a little information from Chief Jamie Rush. Hi, Chief. Hello. We want to take the opportunity to provide an update on anything new or different, or even if it's the same. Uh, just can you give us the latest on what PPB staffing situation looks like now that we're about eight weeks into this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so far, PPB has not seen um, a significant change in our staffing. Um, we are continuing to monitor our sick rates, and they're at about the same level that we would normally see this time of year. So, uh, we are aware of members who have been tested but um, I continue to knock on wood. We haven't had anybody test positive, um, but our incident management team watches that, watches that every day, looks at every little spike, um, looks at every incident that we have, um, any possible exposures, and they're keeping track of that. And they're also trying to um, develop any type of contingencies that we may think of so that we're ready if something does happen. So can you talk about any other changes that have been implemented in the past couple of weeks at PPB. Yeah, so I think one of the, um, the, the biggest things is that we have implemented a new process, a new screening process when employees come to work. So anybody who has to physically report uh, to one of the PPB facilities is required to um, take their temperature before they enter. And it's taken by um, another trained member. Um, so everybody's had the training, so we can you know test each other as we're coming to work. Um, and that's just another way for us to in try to ensure that we aren't unknowingly spreading anything. You know, somebody may not have any symptoms or not realize that they have a fever or something like that. So um, there were some questions um, from our members at first as to why are we just starting this now. And uh, the answer to that is it was an idea that we knew we wanted to do a while ago, but as everybody knows, getting supplies like the actual thermometers took a while. So um, it wasn't something that we just thought of. It's just that we just got the equipment to now start the process. So uh, it started on Wednesday. And these are the um, non-contact yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're infrared. the infrared thermometers, so we don't have to. We wear gloves and masks and stand apart, and you can accurately take the temperature that way. So let's talk about um, what any new trends are for crime rates in Portland. Okay. So um, this time we were able to look at a broader time frame. Uh, we did. We looked at an eight-week period ahead. Um, so we looked from March 12th to April 29th, uh, compared that to the same time frame last year, and then compared it to the eight weeks prior for um, some of the some of the stats that I'm going to talk about here. For our calls for service, what we're seeing is that they're trending back up, and we're almost at what we would consider kind of a normal level for this time of year for a lot of our call types. Um, there was a slight decrease last week um, in uh, civil calls, um, and if you'll remember from previous conversations, the civil calls include the calls that um, people are calling in for violation of the governor's order. So we did see um, a little bit of a decrease in that last week, um, and we also saw a little bit of decrease in um, calls that we call premise checks, so looking around maybe for something that somebody may think is suspicious. Um, so for um, burglaries, we talked about that, I think, a couple weeks ago, and uh, I noted the change from residential to commercial burglaries. Um, so we are seeing about two more calls per day compared to the same time frame in 2019. That also equates to about 2,000 or 2,000, two more calls per day um, from the eight weeks prior. 
Um, but the the positive note is that we are making more burglary arrests. So, um, for example, the week of April 19th, we made um, 17 arrests related to burglary, where if you compared that to the eight weeks um, prior, I think we were averaging three to 11 burglary arrests during that time. So we are um, arresting folks for these crimes. Um, we have seen an uptick, but the officers on the street are doing a good job trying to apprehend those people. Um, as far as vandalism, we have noticed an uptick in vandalism. Um, last week, uh, PBB responded to about 17 calls per day related to vandalism, which is an increase of about three calls per day um, compared to the to the eight weeks prior. Um, and this is where we're really asking for the community's help. If you see something, please call, please report it, especially if you see something in progress so that the officers can get there. Um, the disturbance calls, we have seen an increase in disturbance calls um, with an average of about nine more calls per day compared to um, to the eight weeks prior. Uh, but disturbance calls are one of, one of, if not our most common type of call. So we do respond to a lot of those. Um, domestic violence, um, compared to the same time period. So I think when we talked about domestic violence previously, I talked about domestic violence arrests. Um, and this, uh, some of what I'll talk about now, we were actually able to go back and look at domestic violence reports. So compared to the same time period last year, the reported DV incidents are unchanged, but what we're still seeing is an increase in the number of arrests that we're making. So um, we've had about, I think it's an average of about 13 more arrests per week for domestic violence compared to the eight-week time frame prior. Um, so, but keep in mind that a lot of domestic violence crimes are mandatory arrests, uh, especially cases involving injury, and this could be one of the drivers while we're seeing an increase in the number of arrests. So we'll have to look further into that information. Um, for shootings, um, the analysis of the shootings does show that a 25% increase from this time last year, or this time this year compared to um, this time last year. Um, but our GVRT members have made some uh, significant arrests over the last couple of days and have recovered several firearms. So what I'm hoping is that those arrests will have an impact um, and we'll see a decline in the number of shootings. Um, but I know, Chief, on that, we had a, an arrest earlier this week where, you know, it was involving a shooting in a park and right. we had... Um, part of the information came from community members who yeah. helped provide needed tips. Um, and I just want to take that second to reinforce how important it is. Yes. I know you've been stressing that, but we so appreciate and need that information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I was going to highlight that as well as the fact that, um, that, that specific arrest, um, the information that was provided by the community was greatly helpful um, to the investigators and they were able to make an arrest in that case. Um, the other, uh, I think, uh, stat that we were going to talk about was um, traffic-related. Um, so we have seen a decrease in the number of collisions. There's less people out on the street driving, um, and traffic has issued um, twice as many warnings and citations or warnings um, and citations compared to this time last year. Um, but we are still seeing significant speeding. Um, and I can't stress enough how dangerous that is um, and just really ask people just to take the time to think about what you're doing uh, and the danger that you're putting yourself in and everybody else that's out on the road um, just to drive faster. Um, and between April 12th and April 25th, uh, PPB issued 17 citations for people um, uh, speeding in excess of over 100 miles an hour. Wow. And um, that is a lot. It's too many, actually. Um, our Dewey arrests um, have declined. Um, obviously, you know, the places aren't open. So um, um, uh, suicide calls, they have remained um, at average. Um, we have not seen an increase. We did see that increase at the beginning, but thankfully um, we have not seen that continue. So um, again, we're hopeful that the resources that are available to folks are what they're reaching out for. That's great. So kind of looking forward, what do you anticipate for the next month? So it kind of seems like, you know, we've gotten everything in place, um, our personal protective equipment, um, you know, the officers have all of the options available to them. I think folks are getting more used to wearing these, um, having to talk with them on, having to see other people, you know, in them, the community is getting more used to seeing us. So I don't, I don't want to say that it's beginning to feel normal, but, um, you know, I think, um, people are just becoming, um, 
I guess, more comfortable, uh, you know, with, with certain things that we're having to do right now to protect ourselves. And so uh, my plan will be that uh, PPB members will continue to wear their protective equipment probably for um, quite a while. Uh, we have to, as the decisions are made um, throughout the city and the state um, to, to make changes about what's open, we have to make sure that our members remain protected and we don't want to have a surge like impact the Bureau. So I'll be very cautious about when I start uh, making changes to uh, the PPE related to PPB, if that makes any yeah. sense. There's, <laughs> it's I'm glad I didn't mess, a mantra. mess that up. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so we'll continue to watch the trends uh, to provide as much information as we can to folks to keep people aware of what the Bureau is doing. Uh, but I would like to highlight, um, today is May 1st, and uh, so it's May Day. Uh, we um, have had a couple small um, demonstrations done by vehicle just across the street from us. Uh, I appreciate uh, the community's willingness to um, to abide by the governor's order, um, stay separated, stay safe, um, and I think that that's all going well today. So I can't stress enough my thanks to the community for for um, following that order, especially on this day, and understanding that it's it's very important to stay safe. So uh, May is also Mental Health Awareness Month, and so we really want to stress the importance of that and the importance of reaching out to your loved ones, to your family and friends, making sure that everybody's doing okay, just checking in, just saying hi, uh, making sure that people know that resources are available to them. So you'll, you'll hear um, a lot of that from the Bureau this month. Awesome. So any final thoughts, anything that I forgot to ask about? Um, so next week is uh, the city of Portland will be um, recognizing the uh, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Week, and the Police Bureau will be in full support of that. Uh, we were in full support of the um, full faith and credit um, memo that came out. Um, our officers have been trained on that. And so um, you will see um, support from the Bureau and related to that as well. Yeah, and we just want to bring attention um, along with the city to, you know, um, some of the disparities, especially with different crimes yes, related absolutely. to Indigenous women. And I know there will be more from the city coming out about that. Yeah. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Appreciate your time, Chief, for yeah. coming out again. Thank you very much. Great. Yep. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to The Talking Beat. Do you have a question for us? You can call and leave us a message on our dedicated voicemail line at 971-339-8868. Or send us an email to talkingbeat at portlandoregon.gov. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. More episodes can be found at our website, portlandoregon.gov slash police slash podcast.